What's the big idea behind this? Well, this is the Accessibility Design Centre, and it's where we try to bring together our engineers and experts with the latest AI technology with people with disabilities, because there's a real opportunity to firstly help people with disabilities enjoy all the technology we have in our pockets today, and sometimes that's not very accessible, but also build tools that can help them engage better in the real world. I mean, is there an acknowledgement here that, I mean, if I think about my life and the way it's been transformed by technology, mm. perhaps people with impairments mm. haven't seen all the benefits of the technological revolution? I think that's right. And I think, you know, what we've seen with the pandemic is the tech acceleration, which means we're even more using technology than ever before. And we want people with disabilities to be able to benefit. An example, uh, AI has allowed us to build live transcription. So on an Android phone, you can activate uh, a module where what is being said can be transcribed in real time. So somebody who's hard of hearing can suddenly use a tool like that, which is absolutely brilliant. It doesn't even need to be connected to the internet. And that's thanks to the wonders of machine learning. Something else we're launching today. What is machine learning when you yeah. say that? So this is, I mean, AI, machine learning, all that sounds very complicated. Just think about it as a toolkit that's really good at sort of spotting patterns and making predictions better than any computing could do before. And that's why it's so useful for things like understanding language and speech. Um, and I was going to say another product which we're launching today is called um, Project Relate. And this is for people who have non-standard speech patterns. And we work with a, an array of people with, with such uh, issues uh, to build a tool that can understand them better. So one of the people we work with um, is maybe less than 10% of the time can be understood by people who don't know her. Using this tool, that's over 90% of the time. And you think about that transformation in somebody's life. And then you think about the fact there's 250 million people with non-standard speech patterns around the world. So that's the ambition of this centre, is to unite technology with people with disabilities and try to help them engage more in the world. And, and this is about helping people um, you know, enjoy the same freedoms and abilities and tools that everybody else does. Exactly. But, but, but struggle with just because of a physical or mental impairment. I mean, just explain the, the gaming. Yeah, so we're looking at ways in which people interact with technology. So, you know, obviously one thing is tools that help you engage more in the world. Another is engaging with technology through different interfaces, switches, controls, eye tracking and so on. Again, we're using experimentation with video games to look at what we can do, but also built into your phone. So on Android, you can use eye tracking to control your phone now. And that's an incredible technology that would previously have required a room full of computers to do. So that's some of the things which we're doing. There's also a way that these things can translate into tools that work for everyone too. So live captioning of videos is something that was built for the, video, um, for the um, hearing impaired. But actually, we all use that today if we want to watch a video with the sound turned off. So I think these things cut across uh, different users. And a lab like this is really important because we can work with the Royal National Institute for the Blind, Deaf and other uh, expert bodies to bring together people with disabilities and the latest technology. How far away are we, though, from making science fiction reality? You know, we're all used to seeing, you know, for decades, mm, mm. you know, the idea of robotic arms, mm. of chips implanted in brains. Mm. You know, is, is, are we ever going to get there? Well, I think there are applications that were science fiction when I was growing up that are real today. And I think, you know, my favorite is Google Translate. You know, we talk about AI and the ability to understand languages. You can now real time translate between two people using a phone into different languages. We've just announced recently advances where we've brought on another thousand languages. It used to be the case we learn languages by looking at things like EU translations of the greatest yeah. translators of texts between two languages. Now we can learn a language like a child does just by looking at one language. And that is transformational for many lesser spoken languages. Think about people like that being able to access the entire internet. Yeah. Uh, that's transformational. That's the Babelfish. Yeah, exactly. From, and I think that's, you know, the that's, Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you've got a, a phone and you use Google Translate, that's a reality today. Right. But, but what about things like making people who are in wheelchairs mm -hmm. able to walk, mm -hmm. exoskeletons? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Musk is talking about putting chips in people's heads. Um, yeah. is, it, is, it, is it real? I think that um, you know, our focus at Google is largely around software and apps that people can use um, using things like language recognition, looking at eye tracking signals and so on. But it's definitely the case that there's an acceleration in what machine learning and computing can do to build better tools for everyone. 
And if you think about, for example, how drones fly, you know, that's only possible because computer technology has gone on in leaps and bounds to stabilize them. So I think we will see lots more innovation on the health side than we've ever seen before. It's a very exciting time to be in research and development, but you have to do it in conjunction with the people with disabilities. And that's why a lab like this is so important. Machine learning, artificial intelligence takes us to one of the myriad issues we'd like to talk about with regard to, to Google. The, the, the one that's right on the news agenda right now is the online harms bill. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what is Google's view? You know, does this legislation make us safe? I think the, the objective of the online safety bill, the online harms bill, is absolutely one which we fully support, which is about you and your family need to be safe online while protecting your privacy and while protecting freedom of expression. It's something, you know, we don't wait for regulation at Google to try to do that. We have a whole array of things which we do today um, to help protect families and children online, whether it's experiences built for children like YouTube Kids, tools built for parents like Family Link that allows you to control your children's devices, which apps and sites can they see and for how long, uh, and various other things we do like Safe Search to help people stay safe online. But I think it is right that we see regulation coming in to define more clearly the responsibilities of technology and platforms in, in safety. The devil's in the detail, and we'll see more of this iteration of the bill next week, so I can't come, yeah. comment on the detail. But it's about putting the duty on you to act I think it's right. it's, more it's, proactively, isn't it's it? It's absolutely right. You know, we have significant responsibilities for online safety. We don't wait for regulation, but I think we welcome it because it establishes clarity for all of us who operate technology. At the moment, how much of the moderation Google does is done by people and how much mm. is done by the mm. machine? Well, let me take an example, which is YouTube, which is our, our platform that hosts user-generated content the most. And what we do there is we have, I think, over 20,000 people now on content safety across YouTube and other Google uh, products. How does this work? And this is the heart of what the online harms regulation and similar regulation is all about. It's about content that is not illegal, but might be harmful. How do you define what that is? And actually, that's not something that technology companies should do alone. So, you know, I've been very closely involved in this over many years with, with YouTube. Take an example of something like violent extremism. We noticed that um, violent extremists were using video to try to radicalize people. That's an example of something that's harmful, but not necessarily illegal. We went out and we worked with over 150 expert organizations from the Home Office to Europol to language experts and others to come up with a proposal on policies that would discriminate about what would and wouldn't be classified in that way. We then used those policies to have humans classify videos until we could get the humans all classifying the videos in a consistent way. Then we use that, that corpus of videos to train machines. And then we report on how successful we are on that policy. So today I can tell you that on violent extremist content that violates our policies on YouTube, 90% of it is removed before a single human sees it. And that means that the humans can look at the difficult edge case uh, content. So um, we will never be perfect and we'll always need new policies, but I think it's right that we have clearer responsibilities through regulation um, that help to guide what we and other platforms need to do in this context. But on harmful but legal, can artificial intelligence tell the difference between a documentary about um, young men and suicide mm. and a suicide promotion video. Right, so that's a really good example because this is all extremely nuanced and what you need to do is define policies first of all and that's where you need to work in conjunction with other people. Once you've defined policies as I've just illustrated, you can with people and machines get better and better and better at making those nuanced calls. It can never be completely perfect but we've proven in, in a number of content areas now that it is possible at scale to manage these things responsibly. But it takes a lot of people and a lot of technology and also collaboration with society. So we, for example, pioneered codes of conduct with the EU around hate speech and misinformation to try to define more clearly some guidance as to how platforms should think about these complicated issues. I mean, it's interesting you bring up the EU. I mean, with Britain being outside the EU now, mm. does that create... Um, does that make it more difficult for you to create standards? Well, I think there's a few things here. You know, people have asked me over the 16 years I've been at Google, like, why isn't there a European Google? And I think one of the reasons is so many different rule books for the digital space. And so, you know, one thing that uh, can help is consistent rules across countries to allow people to get to scale and operate with similar policies. So, so the idea of Britain dropping GDPR is, well, not, is not attractive to you? I think if you were a technology startup in Britain, 
you want to be able to reach as many people as possible and having fewer rule books and clearer, simpler rules is really helpful to that. So diverging from the EU on technology, on data protection and data transfers would be problematic for tech companies in the UK. I mean, overall at the moment, do you think the danger is of over-regulation or under-regulation? You know, is the danger that you're going to actually cut out stuff mm. that you shouldn't be? I think that, you know, what's right is that um, the explosion of the use of technology and its importance to society means we absolutely need clearer rules of the road. Um, I think the pace of change in technology means that, you know, you won't simply be able to have a bill that sort of sits in stone for 10 years because if you go back, um, you know, 10, 15 years, we didn't have smartphones and regulation couldn't have envisaged all the things which we now see today and take for granted all the things we're developing here in lab. So you need a combination of clear rules and responsibilities, but then codes of practice and engagement with regulators on emerging threats and emerging harms and emerging technologies. And what regulators and technology companies together have to do is try to get that balance right between the incredible innovation that's possible that can help people, technology for good, and the kind of harms that can be caused by technology and the responsibilities that we all share to address those harms. I mean, although Google does all these sorts of things and you know, steps into different parts of our lives, I mean, you are, I guess, essentially still an advertising and search giant. So you're in a good position to tell us economically mm. what the impact of Brexit has been. Mm. What, what have you seen? I mean, I, I see the reports that I read, but I also talk to our customers. And you're right, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of customers, mainly small businesses in the UK. When you search for cycling shoes, a little manufacturer in Nottingham can appear to anybody in the world. And that's been one of the growth engines of the UK. It's been a leading country in terms of e-commerce and exports. And what I hear from many of them is that um, they've just had to stop exporting to Europe because of the complexity and uncertainty of costs of the current rules. And it's clear from some of the... Uh, data we're starting to see now that you know the, the current relationship with Europe needs to be improved if we're going to find a way to recover that sort of 4% of GDP that the government's own figures suggest we've lost. So I think it's a really important time to re-establish um, a, a set of rules that are easier for small businesses to comply with because we've got this huge inflection point. You know, over 60% of the planet is now online and if you're a small business you can sell to all of those billions of people. You want to be able to do that in, in the lowest friction way possible. For as long as Google has had market dominance, we've been having a conversation about the dangers of how big Google is. Isn't the current situation that we look across at what's happening at Twitter and Elon Musk, and you think, well, for all Google's current responsibility, and people will debate to what extent it's, it, it's good or bad, the danger is that you become effectively an autocratic state that does bad things. But what's to stop that happening to Google? I think um, you're right that Google's been really popular and I'm pleased that we've managed to sustain the popularity of our, our tools. Um, it's also right that when you have that level of popularity, you have significant responsibilities. And what we've aimed to do and what I've aimed to do in the 16 years I've been at Google is to engage with government and society and communities around what those ways of behaving are. Of course, people have, you know, you might say, well, Google's incredibly popular as a search engine. People have got choice and they search in lots of different ways using social media and other different tools on different things. Um, but our responsibilities are really high. We publish our policies and we engage in developing and, um, and changing them over time. But we also um, uh, are really pleased to see new rules of the road being written, things like online safety bills, uh, GDPR in Europe, the Digital Services Act. These make it clear what the responsibilities of technology organisations are. We set a high bar and we don't, we don't wait for regulation. We try to sort of be clear about this is what we're doing and be transparent about our policies. And then you can judge us by our results. But you see, you see the parallel. I mean, I mean, I know Twitter is much smaller and much more limited, but we are now talking about the implosion of Twitter being possible. Mm. It could cease to exist. Mm. Is there anything to stop Google one day being in the same... No, I think that's one of the challenges of technology. You know, are you that vulnerable? One of the challenges of technology uh, is that uh, something new can come along and overnight be just completely different category better. And so one of the things we work really hard at Google on is making sure that, for example, search is always innovating and always trying to get better. You don't have a sort of natural position. It's very easy to switch from one app to another. And I think that's one of the things at Google that drives competition. We've always been focused on sort of openness so it's very easy for you to switch from, for example, your Gmail account. We allow you to take your own data out and put it somewhere else. 
we want you to be able to have choice, and that means that we have to work ever harder to um, encourage you to see our services as good and compelling. It's always been your success, though, that is the thing that people have attacked you for, isn't it? Because you become dominant. Right now, you've got another case where publishers are saying, well, mm. you've been so successful, we've been unable to, mm. to make money. Mm. What's your sort of principled answer to that? Well, let's take, let's just take news publishers. Actually, um, Google's probably the biggest funder of journalism globally. And that's because of a couple of things we do. Firstly, when you search Google for a news story, we send you to one of 80,000 news publishers who are who they say they are, like Channel 4 News. Um, and that's one of the ways we ensure we fight misinformation by giving you access to quality content. That's 8 billion times a month in Europe. People come from Google to a publisher. Um, so that's huge free traffic to publishers. But then we also help publishers monetize through advertising, usually advertisers they don't have relationships with. And um, in the UK, over the last three years, I think we paid out something like 250 million pounds to the top five news publishing organizations. That's advertising that funds original content, just like Channel 4 News is funded by advertising. And then we work hard on other tools to help, for example, win subscribers. So we do an awful lot to help fund journalism. And actually, when I talk to editors and publishers, what you hear is that journalism's in a pretty healthy state. People have got more choice than ever before, more diverse sources. But many organizations are starting to really successfully make the shift to a multi-channel uh, digital world. But you are now such a big player that you're, you're almost competing with states. You know, when it comes to artificial intelligence, aren't you really competing with the Chinese now? What do you think is the threat mm -hmm. that, that we are up against when it comes to AI? Mm -hmm. And do you think it's understood I think, I mean, there's a challenge because AI is a field that's developing so fast. It's capable of so much positive innovation. If I look, you know, just across the road here, DeepMind, they have um, uh, produced over 200 million proteins that their structures have been modeled using AI. And that means a huge acceleration in drug discovery and fights against diseases, a hugely positive um, development that was never possible before AI. So there's a huge amount of positive to come from AI. But equally, technology is neutral. I remember sitting with an Italian politician, he held up his fork and he said, you know, Matt, I can eat this lovely pasta with this fork or I can stab you in the hand. That's technology, it's neutral and it depends how it's used. So we need to also be involved in using AI to understand the risks of AI and how to counteract them. So what our approach at Google has been is to publish the principles we use for thinking about AI and also to publish and share our practical experiences in things like how you um, deal with bias in data and so on and to engage with governments and other organizations and businesses that are working on AI development. And I think it's important for Western governments um, to support uh, investment in and innovation in AI. We know that China and other powers are doing the same, and we want to make sure that we put technology to work in service of how we want our societies to run. Is there a danger um, that, you know, we often see access to Google or access to YouTube in autocratic states as you know, a measure of freedom. Mm. Is there a danger that actually it, it gets used by those states against mm. their own people? That if you can view YouTube in China mm. using a paywall or whatever, using a mm. VPN or whatever it might be, the state might also be able to see what you're doing. Well, let me take a, you know... E effectively, sorry, I mean, does Google become a weapon, you know, that the state mm. can use against people? Well, I'm responsible for our operations in Ukraine and previously in Russia. And so let me sort of talk you through a little bit about what's happened there absolutely vital to do four things. One, ensure that quality information is available to people in a moment of absolute crisis in Ukraine. So we put in place um, a set of measures. We put our infrastructure in front of Ukrainian websites, news websites, government and NGO websites, so that they couldn't be taken down by uh, traffic attacks that where people send fake traffic and knock over websites. Uh, we worked on YouTube, for example, to take down thousands of videos and channels which were Russian state sponsors actors saying you know, these tanks are coming to your village they were fake so really sort of fight misinformation and ensure that quality content can rise for the people who are in a moment of crisis second thing is humanitarian aid so we actually supported over 45 million dollars worth of aid to surrounding countries and Ukraine supporting refugees the humanitarian crisis is enormous thirdly Russia you know obviously like every other uh, organization we followed the sanctions against Russia so that meant blocking Russian media internationally uh, uh, but what we have done is managed to have YouTube still operating in Russia so 90 million Russians a month are active on YouTube and that carries Channel 4 News and other Western news sources which are otherwise unavailable many uh, Russian local independent news sources were forced to 
to close down. So that's some of the ways in which we act in, in those circumstances to try to ensure that people have access to high quality information and we fight misinformation. Yeah, I mean, I suppose my point is, is, is there a danger that a Russian who accesses Channel 4 News mm. might, make them, might make themselves, might put themselves at risk? Because the Russians can probably see that too. Well, I, I mean, I can't speak for the detail of how the Russians operate. I think what we try to do is make it safe for people to access quality information all around the world. Matt Britton, thank you very much. Thank you.